was in London for the premiere of Tosca and had to attend the opening night of a sensational play presented by David Belasco, the Steven Spielberg of his time. The play was, of course, Madame Butterfly. But how did Puccini, who spoke no English, have any idea of what it was about? The star, the gorgeous Blanche Bates, might be one reason. And the play was not only written, but more importantly, directed by David Belasco. He was a master of stage magic, and many of his techniques would later show up in the first generation of silent movies. As in those movies, words were unimportant if the images were powerful enough. They were in Madame Butterfly. So what Puccini saw was almost a powerful pantomime. Belasco is one of the most interesting figures of the American theater. He had lived a strange and wild life. I guess that's why he wore a priest's collar and favored black clothes, so they called him the Bishop of Broadway. He was born in the Wild West, where his parents had arrived from London during the gold rush. He really did have first-hand experience of cowboys, gold miners, and their violent camps. And he had his own scrapes with various sheriffs who made up the law as they went along. This part of his life would lead to another Puccini opera, The Girl of the Golden West. Anyway, for Madame Butterfly, Belasco had read the story by John Luther Long, but changed it a little bit for the stage. The original began after Pinkerton's absence. Belasco imagined the wedding between Pinkerton and Butterfly because he was shrewd. He knew what would work for the commercial audiences of that time. The Japanese setting promised wonderful exotic costumes and stage mannerisms, some real, some not. The story of the little Japanese girl, abandoned with her child, committing suicide, eliminated the need for an elaborate plot or dialogue. Velasco wanted strong, dramatic stage characters. His stagecraft would do the rest. And in a way, Puccini knew that it would finally be his music that would turn the stage characters in Madame Butterfly into flesh-and-blood creatures that, after a hundred years, can still bring us to tears. Music, of course, is the centerpiece of Madama Butterfly, and we'll hear more of Puccini's wonderful melodies in Act Three. This broadcast of Live from Lincoln Center continues as our intermission at the New York State Theater concludes with a conversation between our host, Susan Graham, and the music director of New York City Opera, and tonight's conductor, George Manahan. Maestro Manahan, we're so, I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you at this intermission break. And you've just come out of the pit and conducting this incredible music. You know, Puccini's story is, is pretty well known. And it's hard to know which is telling the real story, what's going on on stage or what's going on in the pit. Tell us how the, the story of the music has brought us to this point in the drama that we're at now. What's amazing, of course, we all know the beautiful melodies of Puccini, mm. uh, but what a lot of listeners don't realize is that he was a master orchestrator. He was absolute craftsman of orchestral textures and uh, sonorities. And coming up in the next act, for instance, as a very good example, there's a prelude that describes the night as Chocho san is waiting mm. uh, through the whole evening. And one hears the endless breaking of the waves in the shore of Nagasaki that's in the orchestra. You also hear offstage voices is depicting the fishermen as they're leaving before dawn uh, for the day. And then in the orchestra, you hear dawn beginning to break, uh, the birds beginning to sing, birds in the orchestra, as well as some sound effects that Puccini wanted. He actually wanted the mm -hmm. real sound of birds. And then absolutely, it just bursts into blinding light as it uh, comes together. It's just, uh, and it's a great little tone poem itself as, as we set up the it could be the next a scene. separate set piece in itself couldn't it? it it could be it could be at the beginning of the opera when <coughs> Chocho San and her family are starting to come into the scene that offstage choral writing is so beautiful and it's so evocative of sort of a, a faraway land tell me about Puccini's fascination with with foreign lands and and seems like every opera he, he loved these exotic settings mm -hmm. whether it's Turandot uh, even in Rome for Tosca, I mean, he does the sound effects of, of the bells all, ringing all over the city. Franchula del West. Yeah, always. <laughs> he, he, he loved the, uh, creating the atmosphere with all sorts of offstage effects and colors in the orchestra as well. I think one that's very interesting, that's unique with Madame Butterfly, is in the next act, 
coming up in the third act when the story starts to really turn dark mm. and we see the first time we see the knife and uh, when Chocho San's intentions become clear he does the most amazing thing he starts giving these eastern sounds sound effects in the orchestra not a western orchestra but and what he's drawing on is that sort of those dark traditions and rituals of the mm -hmm. past that are sort of unspoken and we hear these effects that sounds like kabuki theater he asked the percussion gong to be played with metal sticks for the string players he actually says pulled pluck the string with maximum exaggeration so that it sounds like a percussion instrument mm. instead of a pitch these sort of growls from the low brass and it's absolutely frightening and it, i think he's after to show the sort of kabuki ritual this theater. underlying culture that dictates everything that she does really absolutely absolutely and as the as i say as the story progresses to the end it gets darker and darker that's astonishing um you know when puccini of course saw the play directed by david belasco who <coughs> went on to do a lot of silent films with his you know stark directorial uh, techniques it's almost like puccini was writing film music and it wouldn't be the first time that somebody said that but how much, how much are you affected in the pit by what you see on stage? Do you, are you accompanying? Are you leading? Are you, is it all, how does that work for you? For instance, yes, there's a lot of scenes in the end of Act Two where a lot of pantomime happens. And I try to judge the pacing of the music based on the drama, based on the, the real life events as they're taking place. I see, because so your it, timing is, is Yes, so that if I just simply did a, a very slow largo, then the poor singers are up there kind of, moving in slow, slow motion. motion. We've and all so, been there. <laughs> and since I'm a fanatic for movies anyway, and mm -hmm. so, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is film music, and uh, it's, it's so beautifully crafted. And Mark Lamos has taken great pains to sort of bathe this wide open stage in, in stark colors with lighting, the, the bright reds, and the, and, and the colors are very, very intense. How does that affect how, what you are feeling and communicating from the pit? I think because the set is so minimal, and just the set itself, but the colors create the atmosphere. And that, uh, again, that's, uh, I take it from the action. And uh, for me, that's the fun part, when you can sort of bend and shape the production uh, with, with a, even a different set of singers. You know, every, everyone's going to have a different pacing the way they do it. Exactly. Well, tell us a little bit about um, the, your experience with Puccini operas. Have you conducted a lot of Puccini in, in your career, and, and how does this one stack up in the, in the catalog of Puccini operas for you? Uh, I've done a lot of Puccini over the years, especially here at, at New York City Opera. Uh, Fanchula, Tosca, uh, but Butterfly, there's something very special about it, uh, which I, I think right now it seems it's my favorite one. Well, our favorite one is always the one we're doing at the moment. Right. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. But there's so much rich human emotion. And I've always been so jealous of singers who get to sing a lot of Puccini because he didn't write an awful lot for mezzo-sopranos, let's face it. That's true. <laughs> right. But what do you think it was about him who, that, that made him so able to grasp these really deep, intense human emotions? He does have this knack for especially the heroines of bringing them to life in so many ways. Like Cho Cho San is such a three-dimensional character. You she's feel just not... every single emotion that she's having. It's right. all in the music. There's all this inner strength, and yet, uh, you know, I mean, what she goes through, and uh, it's just incredible. And it's so subtle, the way he does it. And even with Tosca and La Boheme, I mean, these, these iconic operas, I guess they're that way because they speak to us so strongly. And we all recognize these intense emotions. I think, uh, I've always thought that La Boheme is maybe one of the five perfect operas in the world because again every character is three-dimensional the story works on its own and you 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 are interested in every one of those characters and it moves along at such a pace what I call real lifetime it does and you feel like you're you're living the story at the moment with all of these characters and especially in this opera yeah. tonight we feel her pain and we feel his sort of cavalier attitude yeah, yes, but it it's is. all in the music, and, and, and we're so thrilled that you're bringing it to life in such a way. It's thank a, you. Thank, thank you, Maestro. It's a pleasure for me to be making sure. this music. We have just enough time at the end of this second intermission for a short pause. We'll be back right after this for the conclusion of Madama Butterfly on Live from Lincoln Center. At the end of Act Two, Cho Cho San was spending all night watching and waiting for Pinkerton to return, expecting that her family was about to be reunited. 
Conductor George Manahan mentioned the birds. Listen for those birds in the opening strains of Act Three, Madonna Butterfly by Giacomo Puccini. Coming to you live from New York City Opera at the New York State Theater. This production coming to you live from Lincoln Center.
The Tragic Tale of Madama Butterfly by Giacomo Puccini. A live performance at the New York State Theater from New York City Opera. Xu Ying Li as Butterfly. For more information about this broadcast and live from Lincoln Center, please visit pbs.org. Erin Elizabeth Smith taking a bow for her role as Mrs. Kate Pinkerton. Jeffrey Picon as Goro. And members of the wedding party now as well taking bows. Jennifer Tiller was our Suzuki. Michael Cioldi as the American Consul Sharpless. James Valenti in the role of Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton and Xu Ying Li originally from Shandong, China as Butterfly. Xu, Xu Ying Li made her debut with the New York City Opera in this very role, Madama Butterfly, on tour with the New York City Opera in China in 2005. And Tyler Christopher Backer as the son whose name is Sorrow. Giacomo Puccini's Madama Butterfly coming to you from New York City Opera. I'm Fred Child. Thanks for joining us live from Lincoln Center.